Good evening. We're, Hello. How are you doing there, young lady? Okay. We're in Romans 1. Does that surprise you? Let's open in a word of prayer. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for everything. We ask that you, again, just meet us. You are so precious to us. We just praise you for who you are and everything you have done for us. We just thank you that you're God. We humble ourselves before you today. We ask that you teach us by your spirit and open up these scriptures to us in a way that's personal and upfront so that we can grow in the knowledge of you. We just thank you for everything, and we say this in your name. Amen. Amen. We've been looking at uh, Romans 117 for the last couple of times we met together. It says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And because of Romans 117, we've been talking a lot about righteousness. Because a lot of people don't quite understand it. And what you have to realize is that God demands it. He requires it from his people. Because he's holy. He's holy. And righteousness is, is his way of doing things. He does it in the right way, no matter what. Now, man stands completely undone. We all know that. He's completely unclean. He's completely unacceptable to the Lord. There's no way around it. He is that way outside of redemption. Inside of redemption, in Christ, he stands upright before God because of Christ, because of what Christ did. Now, we are to walk out righteousness by faith. That's where righteousness comes. I do something because it's the right thing. I believe it's the right thing because the Bible told me. And I have chose to believe that by faith. It all goes back to faith. And faith is a choice for you and I. Now, it's a measure that God gives us. He has to give us a certain measure of faith uh, to believe. But it's your choice whether you're going to believe or not. The Bible tells me it's true. I believe that. God has given me that major faith to believe it. And it's only by faith I'm going to walk it out and find out it is true. And most people don't walk it out to find out it's true. That's why they're in trouble. That's why they're not victorious. Now, we know that uh, we are to walk out this faith in because of the Word of God. We're to follow after the Holy Spirit, which means we're following after righteousness. We're to walk as Jesus walked, which is walking in the path of righteousness. It's all about righteousness. We don't hear that preached very often. Past salvation message, righteousness is the next great message. Because people need to understand what it means to have that rightness in Christ. Positionally, as well, as well as being, as well as doing. Now, the bottom line is the just shall live by faith. We talked about that last time together. The importance of what it means the just shall live by faith. It means the, those who are righteous will live by faith. Those who are righteous, because that's what just means here, will live by faith. If you're righteous, you're going to live by faith. You're going to walk out your faith. You're going to walk out your Christian life because you know it's true. Uh, li living by faith means one's very breath. In other words, I inhale by faith what the Word tells me, and I exhale it by obedience. And I, as I exhale it, I am going to interact with God. I'm going to walk out. It's a spiritual type of thing, not a physical type of thing. And remember, you can't know something unless the Holy Spirit shows you. You can't interact with God unless His Spirit is there. And so we have to realize the breath we're talking about is God's very breath, the Holy Spirit, so that we can interact with Him. Now, faith is not some method. Okay, and there's some people that would have you believe it's a method uh, it's how you get God to move. God doesn't move because you have some method. Okay? You can't manipulate and control God into some movement. Forget that. 
But how many people out there are doing it? And you know who they're, who they're tuning into? Satan, not God. And Satan will give them so much, and then he'll withdraw it from them, and guess who they're going to blame? God. Because Satan has been feeding this false narrative. And that's what I see. I see people who believe that they can uh, arm wrestle God into their way of thinking by quoting his promises. I've looked into their eyes and they look half crazy. Because they're trying to work all this up to get God to do something. And God's like, what? I'm sovereign. Come to me as a child. Come to me and ask. Come to me in the right motive. Come to me not to try to control me, but to seek out my will and my purpose and line up so I can have my way in something. Now, faith, okay, you have to keep in mind that faith is the only way to please God. Without faith, you can't please God. That's what Hebrews 11.6 says. So anything you try outside of faith, God can't recognize it. And count it or reckon it as righteous to him. It also tells us that whatever is not of faith is sin. That's Romans 14, 23. Everything is a matter of faith. True faith. Genuine faith. Now, we are to, to walk or live by faith towards who God is. Not in what he can do. A lot of people are trying to get God to do what they want him to do because he can do it. God is not on some pride trip. He's not, he doesn't have to prove he can do something. We come to God based on his character and what he says, not what he can do. And, and the tragedy is a lot of people put their faith in God because of what he, he can do. Oh, he can do the miraculous. Yes, he can, but it might not be his will. And it may not be his way of doing it. And so all of a sudden people say, oh, well, God, there's no God. Well, why do you say that? Well, he didn't move the way I thought he should. Come on, people. God is God. You're not. I'm not. How can we dictate to God? How can his creation dictate to him as a creator? And yet we try. We try. Okay. Uh, so if you are banking on faith that's in his miracles and what he can do, you have a very fragile faith. And in the end, it's going to fail you. It's going to fail you. Because real faith will lead you to a place of resting in who the Lord is. And trust in Him to work out things according to His purpose. It's about, as we were talking about, stretching out on His promises. That's where we find rest. Knowing they are already done. If He has declared His soul in heaven, it's already done. It's a matter of... Bring it out on earth according to his timing. It's already done. So people's faith, you know, comes down to trusting the fact that God's going to move according to his timing. And what he does is going to be perfect. It's going to be perfect. So we need to understand the gospel, the reality of righteousness. We need to understand it. Because in order to stand before God... We have to understand that we cannot stand in useless robes. In what? In useless robes. Oh, useless. Our works. Our personal works. Our self-righteousness. Those are useless. They're fig leaves trying to cover up just how unclean we are. How much we would stand ashamed before God if it wasn't for what Christ did. Okay, we, we're we always trying to cover up the filthy rags of the old man. Okay, the base profane works of the flesh. We're always trying to cover that up or make it look good or take the stench out of the pig pen and make it believe that it's okay by per putting some kind of perfume on it. It doesn't work. Still there. Still there. It has to be cleaned up. The reality is we need to get it right here. We need to get it right here and now. you got to get your life right here and now before God. The next verse we're going to look at is, is a verse that when I come to it, I'm, I get really sort of sober. And I even tremble a little bit. But before we get into the verse, i got to set something up for you. 
I'm, let's consider Isaiah 56, 1. I'm going to read it to you. This is sort of interesting. Thus saith the Lord, keep your judgments and do justice, for my salvation is near to come. Now listen to him. And my righteousness to be revealed. Now why am I quoting this? Because in Romans 1, Paul says his righteousness is revealed. In Isaiah it says, my righteousness will be revealed. And Paul is saying his righteousness is now revealed. That's an important thing. And how is it revealed? In what way? Because reveal means revelation. Here's the revelation of it. The revelation is this. The just shall live by faith. That's, and it's in light of what? The gospel. It's in light of salvation. Isn't that what Isaiah is talking about? My salvation and righteousness is going to be revealed. Oh, well, Paul is saying, I'm revealing it now. Salvation comes by way of faith. That's passed on from one person to the next. The witness of other believers. And it's simply this. The just shall live by faith. It's that simple. Now you have to keep this in mind. Now as I said, we go over some of these scriptures really quickly. Oh, well, 117 is really nice. No, 117 is a very big scripture in light of everything else. Because if you don't get that scripture down, you're not going to connect something very important. The contrast that he's going to bring. The amazing thing about Paul is that he gives you this one revelation. The revelation of God's righteousness being revealed. But he's going to bring you another revelation. There are two revelations that run one after the other. It's to bring a very powerful contrast to us. We miss the contrast because we skip over 117 because we assume we understand. So what's the second revelation? Is found in verse 18. Uh oh. I don't want to read this, right? For the wrath of God is revealed. Here's the revelation. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. There's three indictments there. Three indictments, and it pretty well covers everything. And what it is, it shows everything that's against true righteousness. And what it shows is that God's wrath is being revealed. So what does the gospel show you? It shows you, number one, what it means to be saved. But the gospel is also the very means in which it's going to bring the wrath of God on this world. Remember, it was one man by the name of Noah that brought the wrath or the judgment of God on this whole world because he stood as a preacher of righteousness. That's what the Bible says. That's not my saying. One man did it. Well, guess what? The gospel will do the same thing. The gospel will do the same thing. It will bring the wrath of God. It's a contrast. The wrath of God is being revealed through the reality of the gospel. So you have to think about that. What is the wrath of God all about? What is it against? You see, in Romans 1, 16, 17, we are given such hope. Such expectation about the gospel. But in this scripture, we are given a sobering warning. A very sobering warning. Now, this is quite a contrast, but what makes me so mad is that most Christians don't think it applies to them. That this scripture really isn't written to them. I think it's because of things like easy believism and cheap grace and, oh, God's all love. Why would he do that to us, right? I think it's drowned out the real seriousness of these warnings. 
And when I talk to people, I say, well, why don't you believe the warnings? Oh, well, it doesn't apply to me. It applies to the unbelievers. Excuse me? The unbelievers don't read this. They don't read this. Is that what the Bible says? Well, we're going to look at what the Bible says. Because it's not my opinion. Okay, so let's look at first, Second Peter, first of all. We're going to go to Second Peter. We're just going to establish something. We're going to be looking at verses in chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. And we got to start there. Then we're going to go back to another uh, book here pretty soon. It says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Number one, you have to know that the gospel is prophecy. Everything about what Christ, the whole shadows and everything pointed to Christ bringing forth the gospel. So man could be saved. Now, I want you to go, and notice it all comes from the Holy Spirit. Second Timothy. This is scripture that people cannot argue with, but they, for, they, don't, they ignore it. We're going to look at it. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. No, Tim, Timothy, I said. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm sorry. Someone had to correct me. I'm in the Corinthians. It's Timothy. This is talking to Timothy. Remember, he had two very important women who encouraged him in the scriptures. Okay, what's the His, verses? It's... 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. He had two very important women, his grandmother and his mother. Speaks about it. So we're going to look at this because he was taught from, as a child, these scriptures by his mother and grandmother. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise, notice, unto salvation through faith. Oh, there's that word. Through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to know some very important words. All, A-L-L, -L, Scripture, is given by inspiration of God. We already know that. And is what? Is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in what? Righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All scriptures, including the warnings of scriptures, are for our what? Instruction. Our correction in attitudes. Okay? It's for our reproof. So that we will line up to righteousness. So that when it's done, we may be perfect Furnished unto, furnished unto all good works. You cannot come to perfection without righteousness. You, and if you are doing what is righteous, you're coming into a place of perfection. But all scripture, the warnings and everything are for your reproof, your benefit, your instruction. So you need to stand and tremble before warnings. You need to take them serious. You need to say, this is to me. Is God trying to show me something today about my own life? Because this is serious. These are not here so we can tiptoe over them because we don't like them. It's not going to change the purpose of them. They're trying. He's wrestling and contending with us in our faith. To line us up to what is right and acceptable. So when they tell me that, I say, what? What do you try and excuse yourself from? Cut it out. We are very, very sick church because we don't believe all the word of God and we don't apply it. We're sick. We have no victory because of it. There is victory when we're doing it right, walking it right, and walking in the ways of righteousness. There is victory. Outside of it, there is none. It's not that we serve a weak God. It's that we have no faith. And we don't believe what the Word says. 
Every bit of it is for me. I, it may not be written to me, but the principles, the truths, they're for me and my instruction. Let me tell you something. The church is sick because it doesn't believe the word of God. It doesn't believe. It has its apply. Every scripture is for their benefit. They don't believe it. They don't believe they have to tremble. They don't believe they have to walk carefully sometimes. They don't believe that because they don't believe the warnings. And there's plenty of warnings in scripture. Plenty of warnings. And this is one of them. So we need to understand it. What does it mean, right? Now, before I go on, I got to give this encouragement. This is talking about wrath. There's different wraths. There's the man's wrath. There's Satan's wrath. There's wrath. And there's God's wrath. Okay? Now, God's wrath, there's no recourse. Once it starts, there's no stopping it. It's it's, it's going to happen. Up until that point, he shows long-suffering because he doesn't want to show his wrath. He doesn't want to show his anger. Tell me which parent in here wanted to show their anger but did by spanking their kid. I mean, we have to be realistic. He doesn't want to show his anger. So what it says in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, And to wait for his son from heaven, knows it says to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. There you got the gospel again. Even Jesus was deliver us from the wrath to come. Notice, it's Christ who delivers us from the wrath to come. Why? Because we are all subject to the wrath of God. We have to understand that every person born is subject to the wrath of God. You have to be delivered from it. And only Christ could do that. He did it through the gospel. It's that simple. So scriptures that warn and admonish us are to be taken to heart. God, examine me. Is there something here you want to show me? I need to apply it. They need to be taken seriously. And I'm going to tell you something. Please hear me. If you love the truth, you will take it seriously. If you love the truth, you will take it seriously. If you have the right fear towards God, you will take it seriously. Every time you come to a warning, you'll stop, pause, and say, Lord, I want to make sure I'm on the right side. Because this is serious. My destination, my destiny, my walk, my testimony is all going to be hinged on this. That's how important it is. It's that important. Now in Matthew 3, 7, John the Baptist warned the religious people. Oh, the religious people. Wow. Flee from the wrath to come. That's what he said to them. It was the Pharisees. The Sadducees, he says, flee from the wrath of God. Wrath is coming, people. The wrath of God is coming. We see it in prophecy. Prophecy is telling us his wrath is coming. When you think the end of this age is about, it's about the wrath of God. He's going to purge. He's going to clean. He's going to separate the tares from the wheat. He's going to throw the wheat, I mean the tares, into the fire. He's going to cause the, the, the wine press to work overtime. It's serious. Well, I hope I'm not part of it. You better make sure you're not part of it, the judgment. You better make sure. The Bible says you can know for sure, but you better make sure. Don't assume, don't presume. No, for sure. Now, not, nothing's more dangerous than assuming I'm okay because of some religious affiliation. You know, I'm, I'm the Methodist, Baptist, or whatever in the corner. doesn't matter. I don't care about your religious affiliation. Or, you know what? I have this doctrine. I don't care what your doctrine is. Okay? It doesn't bring you back to the living Lord Jesus Christ, his salvation. Your doctrine means nothing. 
okay? It comes back to the fact that you really have embraced God's provision. The problem is that there's those who overlook sin. Oh, that's not so bad. After all, I'm me, right? I'm not so bad. It's like I'm elite. I'm God's gift to the world. God doesn't need your gift. He already gave you a gift. Your gift is going to be cast into the fire, okay? Now, wrath, of course, is anger. The anger of God is revealed because of the gospel. Please hear me. The wrath of God is being revealed to us today because of the gospel. Now, the wrath in the past of God was revealed through the law. But it's revealed through the gospel now. And this is where people have a hard time. Well, you know what? The gospel is all about salvation. The gospel is so you can be saved from the wrath to come. You have to be delivered from it. I love what Acts 17, 30, 31 says. In the times of this ignorance, God winked at. There's time for ignorance, right? But now, command us all men everywhere to repent. Isn't that what the gospel calls for? True repentance. Because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. Notice he's judging the world in righteousness by that man. Who's that man? Jesus Christ. Who he has ordained. Whereof he has given assurance in all, unto all men that he has raised him from the dead. He's talking about Christ here. Christ is that reality of the gospel. He's a reality of the wrath that's coming if you don't receive him. He's that great gift of God. So when man stands before God, there's not going to be any excuse. Now, of course, he says that in Romans 1, doesn't he? He says there's not going to be any excuse. We're going to get into that. So it's in Romans 1.17, it was the righteousness of God that was revealed. The righteousness of God that was revealed. But in 18, we see that the wrath of God is being revealed. But from where? Now notice in 17, it says, the, what? The righteousness of God will re be revealed from faith to faith. What does it say about wrath? Uh-oh. It's going to be revealed from where? Heaven. I want you to think about that. That word is overlooked. You need to really sort of mark it. Heaven itself is going to bring forth the wrath. It's going to bring that separation, that clarity from heaven itself. Now, righteousness is revealed from faith to faith. Wrath of God from heaven itself. Why from he uh, I mean, why from heaven? Have you thought about that? Why well, did? Uh, why would you reveal that heaven? Okay. Now, there's another word I want you to notice: revealed against, against, revealed against, where our faith is revealed to us. It's unveiled. We see it. But this wrath of God is going to be revealed against as a judgment. There's no recourse. It's going to be revealed against it. Now, those are tough words to me. They're very tough words to me as I look at it. And I think, okay, it's going to be revealed against. It's coming from heaven itself. Think about that for a minute. Now, God is holy. That's brought out all through Scripture. You can go to Isaiah 6. You can even look at Romans 1, 4. It talks about the holiness of the Holy Spirit. You can go through God's holy, therefore we're supposed to be holy. We have all this about God's holiness. And, of course, holiness is a state. For you and I, it means humility. Because there's no way we can be holy in our own power. It's humility is where that's revealed through us. So in, we are given insight into the ways of sin in Romans 1.18. There's three indictments there. And the reason that it's revealed from heaven, people, is because there's three witnesses in heaven. 
There's also all the books and records in heaven. And the judge, the throne, in which the judge will reign and sit and judge from is in heaven. It's all coming from heaven, the wrath of God. Now remember, the three witnesses in heaven, that's found in 1 John uh, 5, right? The witnesses in heaven, there's three in heaven, 1 John 5, 7. It is the Father, the Son, actually the Word, it's called the Word, and the Holy Spirit. These three are going to serve as witnesses against all unrighteousness. Now remember, it takes two or three witnesses to confirm a matter. There's no way of debating against these three witnesses. And the indictment is going to come from heaven itself. Now that's serious business. So, what we have today is those three indictments are what? Ungodliness unrighteousness and mishandling the truth. Now you will find people all sins falling under one of those. Now Paul is going to separate a lot of them. He's going to show you what the works of the flesh is. But all sins, either you're being ungodly in your conduct or you're being unrighteous in your heart attitude, your approach, the way you're doing things, or you're not handling the tr truth in the right way. That is where all sins operate in that fuzzy area and what they produce on ultimately. All sins will produce ungodly conduct. All sins will uh, produce that unrighteous state or a disposition. All sins will cause you to pervert the word of God. You cannot handle it properly. Now to me that's, that's pretty, pretty Serious, okay? Because he's pointing out here, and when you talk, look at mishandle, it means suppress the truth. Suppress the authority and power of truth in people's lives. That's what it means. And he's bringing it down here to that. Now, the problem is people live in denial, and they live in delusion about their state. They live in delusion about their sin about their heart attitude and about their practices because they want life on their own terms. They want to tack God on where they want to tack God and, and they want to do what they want to do. It, this is my way of saying they want heaven while feeding the flesh, playing footsies with the world and chicken with Satan. You know that chicken game. You have two cars coming at each other. Which, who's going to turn first? We're always doing that with Satan. Huh. I'm going to beat him. And Satan turns off and lets you think you win. And then pretty soon, whap! When you hit him, you're hitting a tank. With your little small car. How's that going to work for you? That's what we're doing, people. When we're not doing it God's way, that's what we're doing. We're playing the games. We're, we're doing whatever. And, and the problem is that people think it's all about what they're doing. No, it's about who they are and who they're allowing themselves to become, who they're serving, who they're coming into agreement with. It's about that. It's about that. You see, Jesus died for our sins. He died so our sins could be taken away. We could gain a new heart. To do what? To walk in the ways of righteousness. But you know what? To do that, there's a couple of things we have to do. We have to deny ourselves the right to life on terms. Then we have to apply the cross to the works of our flesh. And then we have the power to follow him. But not tell them. You see, our cross deals with the inward man more than anything else. 
Christ deals with our sins. He gives us a new heart. He gives us all these things so we can deny ourselves, pick up the cross, and follow him. That's what it's about. It's not about, oh, well, look, I did this. I must be born again. I'm okay. No. There's that application of the walk of the disciple that disciplines your walk, your attitude, and everything else that has to take place in your life. We don't talk about the walk of discipleship, do we? What we don't realize is we are born, a lot of people don't realize this, because we make, as I said, a mistake of simply thinking it's an action sin, is when it's a spiritual condition of the heart, the mind, and the soul, okay? We are born in this condition. It's called a fallen condition. We can call it a lot of things, okay? It's a fallen condition, and Paul, and Paul describes it as an inerrant condition, okay? It has been passed down to us by Adam. It's been passed down to us by Adam. And, and Romans 5, 12, and 14 talks about it. We'll get into it one more when we get to Romans 5. But it's, so it's just not what we do. It's the fact that we have this bent towards sin in our inclination. We have the tendency to justify our sin away in our thinking. Because that's how it is. We have the ability to live with it. We have the ability to live in it without any regard of what is costing. We are born in this condition of sin with a death sentence hanging over us. And that's why Jesus died for us. He had, to, he had to take care of that death sentence that's over us. Now the holy, of God, holy law of God was given to bring an indictment, an awareness of sin to us in our lives. Okay, We can't stand justified unless we come to Christ. So we could see our plight. And understand our great need to be saved. But you see people, well, I, that's the same. Oh, well, it's not so bad. If God said it costs his son, it is that bad. It's worse than you can imagine. And it cost him his son, okay? So Jesus took away our sins, and he took them to the grave when he was buried. How many of you are glad? Oh, thank you, Lord. Take that. My sins to the grave. Grave, I, I don't have to be convicted by them any longer. But we must see him as the only one who successfully can address every aspect of sin. He did it all on the cross. Amen. He did it on the cross. There's nothing you can do about it. He became identified with us in our sin. And it's only as we become identified with him in his death, burial, and resurrection... There's that word, death, burial, and resurrection. That that sin can be taken to the grave. That's why the writer in Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 3, asks this question, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How shall we escape God's wrath? If we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard of him. Remember, from faith to faith is how that witness is passed on to us. And because of what Jesus did when we receive him, we're no longer subject to that law of sin and death. They called it the law of sin and death. But now we're under another law. It's the law of the spirit. If you have been born again, you're under another law. It's the law of the spirit of life, Christ Jesus' life. The spirit of God's in you. He is working the life of Christ in you. That's what he's doing. The more you give way to him, that's what he's doing. It's a newness of life. And it was all because of the work of redemption. <sighs> Thank you, Lord. So you have to realize that you, if you've been born again, you're marked by the Spirit of God. You're hid in Christ's righteousness. You're, marked for, you're not marked for God's wrath. You're not marked for it. But those who are marked for God's wrath, they need to recognize their precarious plight and flee it. It's called repentance, brokenness confession of sin, and asking Christ to save them. 
Now remember, it all comes out of an ungodly conduct, an unrighteous heart attitude, and a mishandling of the word because you're in the wrong spirit. Please hear me. There's only one spirit that can help you handle the word of God correctly, and that's the Holy Spirit. If you're in the natural spirit, or if there's a spirit of the world, you're not going to handle the word of God correctly. And it's going to get you in tons of trouble. Now you may sound all right up front, because you may have the scripture down, but eventually you're going to go off of the beaten path. And you're going to get yourself in trouble. It all comes down to handling the word in the right spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can teach, reveal, unveil the word to you the way you need to understand it. Keep it pure. So this all comes down, this wrath is all on ungodly conduct and unrighteous heart attitude and so forth. Okay? And it comes down to this. Righteousness is missing. Righteousness is missing from it. It's that simple. There's no righteousness to be found, counted, or had. It's not there. And what's in, in place is wicked practices. Now you can't let God's pure word be spoken with a wrong spirit. You can't have self-serving agendas behind the word. You're going to pervert it. You, you can't uh, you can't have wrong, wrong priorities without perverting it. Okay? Why you're sharing the word with people. You really got to examine yourself. How you're handling the word. You have to examine yourself. This is so vital. Okay? Uh, you, can't, you can't judge if you're in the wrong spirit, you're going to judge the word instead of letting it judge you. You're going to adjust the word instead of letting the word judge you. If you're in the wrong spirit, please hear me. It's that simple. I've been in the wrong spirit. I know what you can do with the word. It's very dangerous. That's why there's greater damnation on teachers and preachers of the word. Because they really have to be careful how they handle the word. Because it's going to judge them. It's going to come back and judge them down the line. Now, remember, poor Isaiah, he said his lips were unclean. And it made him totally unclean uh, in Isaiah 6. And so they had put coals on his lips. He says, I, I'm from among people of unclean lips. What he was saying is when we speak even the truth, we pervert it. That's why people can't hear it. That's why they're in the, in the condition they are is because they have become indifferent to the word because it's been mishandled. Now when you have people sitting under a heretic, they're dull to the word. The true word of God, they're dull to it. And that's the reason why. Now God's word displays its authority. Please hear me. God's word displays its authority when it's spoken in purity. If the word of God is being preached in purity, you will hear that authority. Okay? Uh, its power is displayed when a person is truly anointed and ordained. The power of the word is is displayed when that person has sought God's face. I need to know what you want me to share. And he shows them. And the power comes down through anointing as they preach it with power and conviction. And of course, here's the big one. It will penetrate. God's word will penetrate. The light of it will penetrate. It's sharp whenever the truth is not being compromised. When the truth is compromised, you take the sharpness away from it. It can't penetrate. And if you take the sharpness away from the truth, it can't set a person free. Because we're talking about chains, unseen chains, 
held in by things that have corrupted and perverted and the only pure truth can penetrate, set free someone like that. I'm here to tell you Satan could care less what you quote. But if you quote the word of God in purity, in that authority, in that power, he will bow to it and then he'll have to flee because that's the only thing he respects. So God's word should never be used for personal agendas. May I say that? Rather, it must be established, it must establish what is right and acceptable in our lives by God himself. Now here's a scripture you can't get around. It's a new Christian, I learned this scripture. I also learned 2 Timothy 3 that we just read about the word. I learned about Isaiah 64, 6. It says, our best is filthy rags. I learned the law of the Romans road. I don't hear people know that today. No. I don't hear them know that. Uh, I learned a lot of those things. I'm thankful for that church I went to. It was pretty legalistic, but it taught me you need to know scriptures. And uh, I remember we had this game that every before we went to Sunday school, they would throw out scriptures to us and see who would get it first. Of course, it was that young punk in the front that always got it first. <laughs> he was only about 11 or 12. That kid was sharp. I'm here. I think, oh, but you know, it forced me to get in my word. And I don't see that happening. I don't see people challenging people so that they get in their word, so they know where uh, their, their, their different uh, scriptures or books are or whatever. I don't see that at all. And I'm so thankful that happened. And I remember I went to a navigator's deal when it used to be really <laughs> very basic. Bless you. And the navigator guy who was there, she, he said, how many have read your Bible through? Now, I've been a Christian for maybe four or five years, and I raised my hand. I, I read the Bible through at least four times. My pastor raised his hand, glad for that, but there was very few people that raised their hands. Very few people that raised their hands. That ought not to be. Where's the challenge? We send our soldiers out, these jealous, uh, zealous soldiers out, without any boot camp training. And then we wonder why they walk away from their faith. There's no discipling going on. There's no teaching going on. There's no challenge going on. How do you use your word? Now listen to what Paul said. This is Paul. I learned this chapter up front, verse up front, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly, what? Dividing the word of truth. That's not an option. That's a command. And I took that to heart. I thank God I took it to heart. Because I studied, I studied, I read. Got a big head over it. So God had to knock me down over that one. But I studied it. And it was there. It was there. And the Holy Spirit brings it up every once in a while. Those who insist on their ways to the end will taste God's wrath. Please hear me. They're going to taste his wrath. There is no recourse from them. Once his wrath starts, there's no recourse. And we have Hebrews 9.27. I'm sure most of you know it. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Now this scripture in 118 should make every believer, and I believe every reader, stop, shake, and tremble a little bit before the Lord. It's not enough to say a prayer, people. Or be affiliated with some church, etc., to avoid God's wrath. You have to be delivered from it 
by Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. You have to handle the truth of God, the truth of the gospel by faith. You have to divide his word properly to avoid walking in delusion. Now we only have this life, this present day to get it right, to flee the wrath of God, to avoid neglecting our salvation. We only have this day to start walking in the ways of righteousness by faith, to believe what this scripture says. So I want to challenge you tonight. I want this verse to challenge you, not me. I want this, this verse to challenge you to the, the seriousness of our walk, the seriousness of our life in Christ. We need to get rid of the silliness and the foolishness and that lack of, that lackadaisical attitude and that, oh, well, you know, I'll get around to it. No. Get around to it today. Say, God, what do you want me to understand? What do you want me to do? And Lord, I'm going to sit here until you show me. Don't settle for crumbs when you can have all that's on that banqueting table, God. Don't do that to yourself. Don't shortcut you, yourself, because you're the one that's doing it, not God. He has provided all for you and me. You see, the reality is that our sin cost God his best, Jesus his all, and it will cost man his soul. And it all comes down to the fact is that God has offered it all. He has provided it all. And it's because of unbelief man will not enter in to all. 